Hello and welcome to another Tech Distractions video. In this one I'm taking an in-depth look at a little graphics card that some of you might have seen around in the early 2000s. It's the 315E from Silicon Integrated Systems, or SIS. I'll be testing it out on a variety of Windows 98 games from around a similar time period, and using the same test rig from my previous NVIDIA Vanta LT project. The motherboard is the A7A266 from Asus, and is a socket a base board containing an AMD Athlon 1333. I can use a variety of AGP cards on this platform, so you might see it pop up in a few more projects. SIS had been around since 1987 and during the 1990s had established itself as a high volume seller of cheap and cheerful CoreLogic chips, such as motherboard chipsets and graphics. In 1997 it joined the quickly expanding market for 3D graphics cards, designed to bring multimedia and 3D gaming to the masses. It released the 6326 series as its first 2D 3D graphics chipset and made numerous revisions to it over a lengthy 3-4 to four year life cycle. Around the year 2000, SIS would develop the 300 series, and this was seen by many as the first real attempt at 3D by SIS, as the previous version 6326 struggled with anything 3D gaming related. At a similar time, the 305 was released, which was effectively a 300 with a 64-bit memory bus and a lower memory clock. This ended up being the chip most consumers saw as the 300 was scarcely found. In December of 2001, SIS would announce the 315, which appeared to have a large performance increase over the 300 sporting a 150 nanometer process and some hefty configuration specs, including up to four texture mapping units and SDR or DDR memory support on the 128-bit memory bus. Again, SIS would make the 64-bit memory bus version of this and call it the 315E. This is the card we're looking at in this video. SIS would reduce their memory clock to 143 MHz, but like the 315, this could also support DDR. A year later, the Zaber series was released, which would sadly be the final one from SIS, as they would go on to form part of XGI with Trident and continue selling the Zaber and the revised Valari family of GPUs under XGI label instead. For testing, it took me a little while to get things stable and reliable. SIS usually puts up a fairly generic driver, and I've had mixed experiences with them, especially when working with discrete cards. The integrated graphics ones I've dealt with on previous video projects really didn't give me much grief. I wasn't trying to do much with them either. With this card, the driver I landed on was 3.53.2, which as far as I can tell might be the last unified driver supporting the 315E for Windows 98 SE that allowed some sort of tweaking and overclocking. If I tried to use anything newer, I couldn't get most of the features to work, and the 3D wizard which did the overclocking would fail to start. To enable tweaking, I modified the setup.ini file by adding performance equals 1 into the top section. This tells the setup program to write the registry keys that enable tweaking that are otherwise unavailable in the driver UI. The most important one for me is the vsync off key. Flicking this to 1 immediately unlocks our frame rate. There are some other settings here containing curious terms like blend and turbo. I did start up a spreadsheet trying to capture each of these settings and the effects I noticed when I changed the values. But unfortunately most of the combinations I tried didn't seem to do anything at all. But I admit, I probably need to spend a bit more time experimenting with this one. My take is that a lot of these are probably for the Zaber series and probably aren't targeted for the 315 or 315E. The only one that seemed to do something was TNL Enable. Switching this to 1 seems to advertise the DirectX that we've now got hardware transform and lighting. But again, apart from saying it supports it, I saw no difference in performance when enabling or disabling. Who knows if it's real or just something SIS advertised is supported without any substance. At the very least, 3 Mark 2001 SE at least ran the tests with it enabled. Overclocking using the 3D wizard, I was able to squeeze a little bit more out of the core clock, but not much on the memory. It took a while to land on the stable range. At one point I was changing 1 MHz increments and getting 3 quarters of the way through testing before a problem showed up. So using a 190 MHz core and 160 MHz memory was chosen for the suite, and I was able to get this stable throughout all the testing. Even at this setting, the heatsink remained cool to the touch, and I didn't even need to have any fan-assisted airflow passing it. SIS seemed to have done a good job making this little guy power efficient, and it's pretty good on thermals. So let's run it through the benchmark results and see how the performance lines up on familiar titles. Starting with GL Quake, it's an older title and I expected to see the 315E to perform very well. Very high frame rates in the 512x384 and 640x480 16-bit modes. Overclocking even gets the 1024x768 16-bit mode to be almost at 60 frames per second. So a pretty good start here. One thing to note, for some reason the 512x384 in 32-bit color wouldn't work for just about any game I tested. That's why it's missing on these charts. Incoming is also an older one, and we see some high frame rates. While the penalty for 32-bit color ranges between 25 and 34% loss, we can still get a good experience at something like 640x480 with the stock clocks. 
Using the overclock settings, 800 by 600 at 32 bit holds on well, and you could even stretch it to 1024 by 768 at 16 bit color settings. Quake 2 starts to push to 315E, and you'd probably stick to 640 by 480 in 16 bit, with or without the overclock. Quake 3 seems to run decently using the normal preset, and if you use the overclock, you can nudge this up to high quality settings. For some reason, the 32 bit color doesn't seem to penalize the 315E as much. Expendable gives us some decent scores here while using the 16 bit low quality presets. Again, 640x480 is probably what I'd stick to here, but you could push up to 800x600 or maybe even turn some of the features on at 640x480 if you were to use the overclock settings. Forsaken is a lightweight title, and the 315E can handle all resolutions up to 1024x768 even with the stock clocks. I did expect to see some higher scores, but to be honest, this is still more than acceptable. With Turok, I also expected to see some high scores here, and the SIS 315E didn't disappoint. Even at stock, the 800x600 is excellent. Moving on to Turok 2, we don't see the huge scores we saw with Turok 1, but we still get an excellent result with all the resolutions tested. Now with these low-end tests, I like to capture a few games with fraps and do some random playthroughs. Need for Speed High Stakes demo seems to be limited to 64 frames per second, but nevertheless, plane's fine on the 315E. Motor Racer reported only 48 frames per second, but never seemed to move from that. I'm unsure if this is an SIS related issue or something else. I'm used to seeing triple digits here, and the game definitely didn't feel sluggish or stuttering. Finally, Monster Truck Madness, where more than 30 odd frames is a bit of a waste. But anyway, we get 150 here, and it doesn't matter. The game obviously runs very smoothly on this card, and you'd expect as much given how old this game is. Overall, the SIS 315E is a competent, adequate lower end 3D card for Windows 98 gaming. It has a similar performance profile to something like an NVIDIA TNT2 Model 64, where sticking to 16-bit colors and lower resolutions like 640x480 will usually get you over 60 frames per second in games that need it. Overclocking the 315E gave an extra 10% performance on average, and in a few games it means you can either switch to 32-bit color or step up screen resolution one peg. Once I found the clocks to use, I didn't get a single crash or artifact during my testing. So what went wrong for the 315 series? Why well, wasn't it a big player in the value gaming market? In an interview with EE Times in June 2001, Director of SIS Multimedia Products Division Thomas Suey referred to the 315 as a marine team, and once it would secure the low cost segment targeting Nvidia's GeForce 2 MX200, it would then be ready to send in the army, likely referring to Zaber, to go after Nvidia's volume seller, the GeForce 2 MX400. The target was to capture 15% of the global chip market, and this definitely would have got them some attention. SIS intended to do this by spending big on fabs and releasing their product after Nvidia, while undercounting them on price. And this for me was issue number one, timing and better options. SIS had a strategy of trying to come in and undercut market leaders and snatch away volume sales. With the discrete graphics market starting to consolidate down to Nvidia, ATI and what was left of 3DFX, it should have been obvious to SIS that time was running out to make a big impact. Waiting for Nvidia to release its three-punch combo in the mainstream gaming market, consisting of the GeForce 2 MX, MX200 and the super cheap TNT2 M64, was a failure. If SIS launched the 315 in full fat form before the MX200 came out, and for a cheaper price, we could have been looking at some serious market share hitting their way. Being 6-12 to 12 months late to a competitor's launch when they've got a 6-month cycle themselves does not make a lot of business sense. All Nvidia had to do was drop the MX200 by 20 or 30 Australian dollars and everyone would jump on board and abandon the idea of switching to a lesser known brand. Funnily enough, that's exactly what happened. By the time SIS would release Zaber, which they saw as being their competitor to the MX400 line, it was game over. Too little, too late. The EE Times interview gives a little bit of insight into some of the strategic decisions and problems that were facing SIS at the time. Sui so calls out the challenge of trying to integrate the new discrete graphics chips into the IGP, resulting in immature solutions being released to market. SIS knew the product had flaws, but had to push ahead anyway. As a result, consumers saw incomplete drivers and inconsistent features on chipsets. By 2001, customers using the IGP were likely businesses or home users who expected stability and drivers for new operating systems, and cared less about additional texture units for 3D graphics. What made matters worse was Nvidia and ATI had made the jump to integrated graphics, and had multi-chip solutions branched off from mature products. VIA was also rapidly advancing its own IGP after its acquisition of S3 Graphics Division. SIS didn't learn from the complexities and shortcomings of integrating its prior 300 core into motherboard chipsets. IGP problems and performance issues reinforced the public perception that SIS was not a serious player in the 3D market. 
Why would you go and target a slightly cheaper discrete card that is marketed similar to these problematic IGPs? Looking at what occurred after the 315 was released, it appears the pivot to the two chip strategy was probably too late anyway. SIS ended up folding the discrete graphics division into XGI along with Trident and went back to trying to iterate the IGP instead. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you know I've got a bit of a soft spot for these type of cards and manufacturers. The ones that most people overlook, or maybe even throw their cards away. I always like to barrack for the underdog. But the 315E leaves me feeling a bit more frustrated than anything else. On the one hand, it's impressive what SIS were able to put out, given their relatively limited resources. I mean, it plays games, and it's a good upgrade from previous models. On the other hand, it barely keeps up with 2-year-old TNT2 M64, which by 2001 was at clearance prices, with much more exciting models coming through. The SIS driver and bundled utilities are clunky, confusing and inconsistent. Simply put, there were better options when this card was new, and there are better options for your retro project today. Like I said with the previous video on the Vanter LT, if you've got one of these spare, by all means, use it in a rig where the CPU is likely to hold frame rate back anyway. Something like a Pentium 2, older Celeron or a Duron. There might even be a good match for something like the Via C3. I wouldn't suggest going out and trying to buy one of these on a the used market. They're overpriced due to a perceived rarity, and it's difficult to figure out what configuration the card might have, as the model names and specs were often confusing. You'd be much better served with something like a GeForce 2 MX400 or something similar. With this card, I might have a go at exploring some more of those registry settings to see what else I can squeeze out of it. If I find anything interesting, I might put up a small video or community post to cover it. Until then, I think it's time to wrap this one up. Thanks as always for watching this through to the end. Take care and see you in the next one. Bye for now.